Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 24th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we provide our periodic update on how oil prices and production are doing, this time as we start the new fiscal year and what those might mean if the trends continue as the fiscal year plays out. Second, we return to the claim by some that the permanent fund earnings reserve is in trouble and focus on the missing $8 billion question around that. And third, we look at recent developments around an old capital spending issue and how that should inform our judgment going forward on new projects. And now let's join Michael. Let's start off with number one, um, which is a look at the new fiscal year and how it's starting out from the perspective of oil price and production. And what does that mean for us if um, what does that mean for us if the budget ends up over what the target price is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we're starting out. We're starting out uh, on a good note this year. We also started out on a good note last year. I'll, I should quickly add. Uh, we started with high oil prices. I, I think we were still over 100 uh, last uh, July. And uh, we started out with strong production, really gave a good kick to the year. Uh, this year, we're, we're not starting out with as high an oil price, but we're starting out with strong oil prices. We're not starting out with as good a production. We're down about 9% from what, you know, using a baseline of last year's production would tell you we ought to be at. So the production's a little thin, but production has the lower has a much lower impact on revenues than does than does price. Uh, the price right now, I, I ran the charts this morning and it'll post at 8.30 uh, Anchorage. Uh, the price right now for FY24 uh, projected price based upon the futures market is about $83, which is $10 above uh, above the $73 price level uh, projected in, uh, uh, in the spring revenue forecast and used as a baseline for uh, the FY24 budget. So price is up and that's uh, that's good. It's uh, worth, um, oh, let's see, it's probably worth about $800 million or so in terms of additional, uh, in terms of additional revenue. So that's, uh, that's positive also if it holds for the year and, and we're way early in the year. So it's way too soon to tell. Uh, but that's, it, it, it caused me to think that strong start caused me to, to think, okay, the, the legislature in the FY24 budget set up tiers. They set up a base budget that was set at $73 a barrel, uh, predicated at $73 a barrel. And then they set up tiers if the price went above that. Uh, one of those tiers kicks in an additional PFD amount that would be paid in uh, FY, uh, uh, well, in the fall of uh, 2024 if it kicked in. So I went back and grabbed that. And yeah, there you go. Have it up on the chart. Have it up on the screen. So I said charts all over the place. Um, and so I went back and grabbed that, and um, uh, it shows that between seventy-three and eighty-three dollars, which is where we are now, the surplus estimated at, at if, if we achieve production levels, estimated at six hundred thirty-six million dollars or so, the surplus uh, would go to the CBR, uh, roughly equates to three billion dollars FY twenty-four ending uh, uh, CBR balance. So it would the first ten dollars of surplus oil prices. Uh, surplus over the 73 projected price 
would go to the CBR and help uh, help refill the CBR once. We only kick into uh, an additional amount for the PFD, uh, which would be classified as an energy relief payment. We only kick into that uh, uh, once we go beyond the eighty-three dollar price level, and we're not we're not neither the current price nor the future prices future price levels in the current futures market are projecting that we're going to get above 83. So uh, we're not into that uh, uh, tranche, uh, the 83 to 105 tranche yet. And above 105, it goes back, uh, goes back to the CBR. So there is, there's good news in the sense that, that prices are starting out stronger. There's not as good news, but not horrible news. The production levels aren't starting out uh, at, uh, at at what one would would have projected based upon last year's uh, baseline, um, so we're a little short on production levels, uh, but that's not as uh, as I say that ha- doesn't have near the effect that that price does. Um, good news on on price, but we're not in the range yet. We've got to go even further uh, to uh, kick into uh, the the price range where uh, we would be. Um, uh, having some additional PFD uh, paid out uh, in, uh, in 2020, 2024. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's a strong start to the year. Um, uh, and, and if I, when I was giving this review last year, after the, after the first month in on, uh, on FY 23, I was saying it was a strong start to the year. And then we saw what happened to the year. Prices fell off. Uh, production volumes came in lower than projected. And we ended up uh, we ended up with a uh, having a almost running a deficit last year. We were pretty close to a deficit. You now we had a little bit of a deficit. Um, so the first month's uh, results are not uh, they're not they're not necessarily sort of like you know past performance that, is not indicative of future results kind of thing, right? Right. Th- things in the rearview mirror may seem farther away or closer or whatever whatever yeah, they, they appear. Right. They appear. Uh, but it's a it, it it's it, it's not <laughs> it's worse than the bad news and it's worse than uh, well, that we're starting out about even so it's it's worth noting um, and it's worth uh, sort of tucking away in your brain as you as you start to you know factor in what's going to go on this fiscal year but it's not determinative yet by far. It's uh, it's interesting to see. We've seen the oil prices kind of go all over the place. Uh, you said you've looked at the futures market. It's not quite there at the $83 plus mark, which is the next level of jump. Where do you think we're going to be seeing the oil prices go this <laughs> rest of this summer and into the fall? I mean, and with production, what does it mean for the state? I mean, is there a best case scenario and a worst case scenario here? Yeah, EIA. I mean, it's it's interesting to look at the forecast. EIA the Energy Information Agency uh, Administration, the the federal uh, uh, sort of uh, guru on prices and numbers and and predictions. EIA is still holding to uh, a forecast, an FY uh, uh, twenty four forecast of of eighty three dollars, and, and an FY twenty five forecast of eighty five dollars, significantly above where the futures market is for FY FY uh, twenty five. And and they are are basing that as are others on on ultimately the Saudi production cuts uh, having some effect on price uh, pulling in or having some effect on on supply and kicking up price as a result of of, of uh, reducing supply. Um, there's there's two factors that are offset that have offset that or that have 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 mitigated that effect so far. One is Russia keeps producing more than than anybody anticipated given the given the sanctions. The Russians are are now uh, able to sell. They've, they've developed enough of a fleet that's outside of the sanction system, uh, enough of a, 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 a tanker fleet that they're that they're actually getting above the price cap that uh, that the Western nations tried to tried to set on their oil price. So Russia, the, the, the Russian uh, uh, volumes continue to be a surprise. And the other big thing that's affecting all this is China dem- uh, Chinese demand. There's speculation, there was, there was expectation uh, early on that China's, China demand was going to come back, roaring back strong. 
it's not done that. Um, uh, and it continues to be China, Chinese demand continues to be suppressed. And so that's had a suppressing impact, impact on demand. And as a consequence, the suppressing impact on price. But if you look at EIA and you look at IEA, the International Energy Agency, which also makes these sorts of predictions, they're both saying that uh, they anticipate that price will continue to remain strong. Futures, the futures market isn't picking up on that. The futures market isn't going to the same levels uh, that uh, that EIA and IEA are saying that they think uh, uh, demand will go to. But the futures market sometimes is is cautious. Sometimes it's overly aggressive, but sometimes it's cautious. And and I think because current demand and current supply continue to remain sort of imbalance. Um, the futures markets being cautious about where things are going. So yeah, the there, 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 there are people, there are people who are expecting better things. Let me, let me say that out there. Well, and just for folks who know the futures market is kind of like a betting pool on where things are going. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm simple, I'm dumbing it down for the people in the back of the class like me, but that's essentially, it's a bunch of experts getting together, trying to predict price. I mean, it's not always, the perfect crystal ball like you said sometimes they're too aggressive sometimes they're too cautious but it's an overall indicator of where people think things are going to be going and of course a lot of this is based on confidence and and everything else so it's an indicator of one kind or another it's, it's an indicator i mean it's people with money i mean you're, you you don't you, you got to put money in to participate in the futures market so it's it's people with money making making bets with money um, and there's also an element in there of producers hedging. I mean, producers will sell forward. They'll sell production uh, six months or, or nine months or a year, or two years forward um, uh, at a, by going into the futures market and essentially hedging their production. So it's, it's people who are, you know, have a, have a serious interest in making sure that they're, that they're, that they're, they're selling their production at, at market prices uh, uh, participating in it as well. But it's, yeah, I mean, you got speculators in there. You got a whole bunch of different people in there, and and it it produces a mix of a range of of expectations, reflects a range of expectations uh, about where things are going. It's the best. I will say this: it's the best indicator we've got from a market standpoint of where people think prices are going. IEA and EIA are good indicators of where, frankly, computer programs think we're going because they factor in. They build these computer programs that factor in demand, factor in supply, factor in all sorts, you know, weather, factor in all sorts of variables and sort of make the best prediction they can out of that. Um, and those are and those are predictions that are based upon the best things that, that, that you know, software programs, computer programs can tell us. But the, but the market, the futures market is the best thing we have, the best measure we have of what of what people with money um, putting money into a market uh, think uh, think where the price is going. So the good news is, is that we're about where we were last year, which seems to be a little bit above water, but you know, that could change at any time We're we're running on, we're running on the edge of one, one way or the other, but if it does go up, at least we know where the money's going, right? Yeah. Yeah. They've, they've set the tiers, which is, and it's not, I mean, last year's tiers, this, this is second or third year they've done this tier system. Last year's tier was, was K through 12 free funding. And there was a whole, you know, Oh, we're not going to have to. We're not going to have to worry about K through twelve because we're going to have these robust prices. We've 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 predicted a low price. We're going to have these robust real prices, and we're going to have all this money in K through twelve pre funding. Well, that didn't that didn't work out. So the, this year's tiers are are not that. This year's tiers are CBR, CBR PFD split, and then CBR again. There is more art to science than when you you know when we're talking about oil prices and everything else and and all these things because again, it's based on Consumer confidence, that's part of it, which is kind of the more amorphous part of it. And then supply and demand factors in and everything else. And But you just you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, look at what happened. You have uh, things get thrown at you, whether it's pandemic or other things that can throw a whole monkey wrench in that whole deal. And uh, so it's it really is a betting club. It's just like best guess. This is our best guess at where things may be going. And it's and it's a best guess we shouldn't be making. I mean, Alaska, uh, the Alaska state government shouldn't be making. We've talked on previous programs about the fact that you know we're living or dying on a guess of where oil prices are going to go for for each fiscal year. We don't do that for the PFD. We don't do that for permanent fund earnings. For both of those, 
we do historic averages uh, and, you know, we have a solid basis, sort of money in the bank. We're just, we're just playing with money in the bank and sort of eking it out on an average basis going forward. That's how we treat, that's how we treat those two accounts. For, for oil, we just do something wildly different that we, that the state got into the, into the habit of in the, in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, and it just can't break, which is, you know, we're trying to guess at where oil prices are going and, 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 and basing our budget on that. We've argued, I've argued uh, in, in, in probably too many commentaries in, in the Friday column we, I do in the landmine and on the show uh, that we ought to be basing oil prices and oil revenues on, in the same way that we base uh, uh, permanent fund dividends and permanent fund earnings, which is on a historic right. average. Well, and if, that, that's number four of the charter of changes is change the budgeting, right? Because, I mean, again, going back to Sean Parnell, oh, he's basing his budget on $115 a barrel of oil and it's already down to 88 or whatever it was kind of thing. I mean, we've said that for years on this program, that they need to do some kind of five-year rolling average of what they've historically brought in instead of this pie in the sky stuff, because it just makes for a budget that is totally divorced from reality in a lot of ways. I mean, it, 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 it would, it would make this show slightly less interesting because I wouldn't talk about oil prices and, and, uh, and, and, you know, give a oil price report every six weeks or so uh, on the show or in the, in the landmine column. Uh, but it would, but it would make our budgeting, a lot more solid. We would be dealing with dollars that are already in the bank and we're just paying them out uh, in a certain way, as opposed to this, this, this process we go through of, oh, let's guess. We guess in the fall, the fall uh, a price forecast and the governor bases his budget on that. And then that'll change. And in the spring revenue forecast, uh, we've got a different set of number and that's what the legislature bases the budget on. And then it changes again. And it just, you know, we, we're, we're always we're always trying to guess ahead as opposed to dealing on the solid ground of, of the money we have uh, we have in hand. And, it, and, and, and the other, you know, another aspect of that, it would make it would it would give our government a, a counter cyclical balance uh, in terms of revenues. Now, <clears throat> when the economy's up, when the economy's booming because oil prices are up uh, and there's a lot of activity on the slope and there's a lot of jobs. We got a lot of state government revenue too, and so we start, you know, pinging that into the economy. We got the economy bouncing around uh, on these high dollars. When when oil prices come down, uh, and and jobs are down, and activity on the slopes down, well, state government's down too because oil prices have come down. So we got it. We've got a problem in the private sector, and we got a problem in the government sector. If we did these averages, we would end up being counter cyclical because as oil as oil prices went up we'd be still, you know, averaging coming from when oil prices were down. And when oil prices were down, we'd be averaging from when oil prices were up. And so we, right. would, have, we, would, we would have a counter cyclical uh, fiscal policy, which is what you want uh, from the government when you're, when, you're, when you're trying to even out your economy. I always found it interesting that you had that kind of counter thing going on between when oil prices were up, the state economy did well. Meanwhile, the private sector was struggling because of the cost of energy and oil and gas and everything else. But when it went the other way around, the state is struggling and people are feeling a lot better because it's costing less to heat their homes and everything else. Maybe this would help that problem uh, as well. I mean, it'd be nice to think that anyway. It would. It would. I mean, everything. It, we, we'd be a lot more balanced if we had if we had if we used an average oil price as opposed to the sort of the sort of, you know, uh, pie in the sky, right? Pie in the sky or, or you know, crystal ball reading. Well, let's uh, move on for a tease of number two. We can hear the drum beats. We can hear the chant of PFD, PFD, PFD. You can already see it. They're coming. You know, they're coming hard, coming after it uh, even more. Uh, give me a quick tease before we go to break. Well, we talked last week a lot about the permanent fund earnings and the and the articles that had popped up the week before about the permanent fund earnings being under threat and and you know maybe we were going to run out of money in the permanent fund, in the earnings reserve account uh, and and you know all sorts of parade of horribles and and sort of tying into the permanent fund corporations push for a constitutional amendment that would unify the two permanent fund funds, the permanent fund corpus and the permanent fund earnings reserve, unify those together and, and make the draws out of that. 
that that drumbeat has continued, uh, and and I'll talk about an op-ed that Larry personally did that that continues that drumbeat, and and it's just really bothersome to me. It's almost like a scam, right? It, it's almost they're they're leaving out facts on purpose so they so they can make their case, but it's not a real case because they're they're leaving out additional facts. And we're gonna what? we're gonna talk about that again. Selective fact selection. I mean, are you? Liars, damn liars is statistics. Are you kidding me? Let's uh, get back into it. The weekly top three, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, joins us. The the drums of war against the PFD. It's a chant. Uh, you could see it in every op-ed, in every piece of uh, news, in every editorial, in the in the Binkley family blog, and all these other things. You could see it. it. All of our problems would be solved if we just stopped giving that ratty PFD to the people. And uh, we just took it for ourselves because we know better than you how to spend this money. Brad, uh, those drums continue to beat and they continue to be deceptive in what they're talking about. Yeah, the latest iteration of that is, is oh my God, the, the, the sky is falling. The earnings reserve account is running out of money. Uh, we, we need to change the way the permanent fund operates so that we combine the permanent fund corpus and the permanent fund earning constitutionally combine the permanent fund corpus and the permanent fund earnings account, and then take the, the percent of market value off of that combined amount uh, going forward. As you pointed out, that's actually one way to, to, to raid the corpus, because if the earnings account gets run down uh, or, or, or if the earnings don't, don't achieve 5% per year, then they're taking some money out. They potentially are taking some money out of the corpus in order to in order to balance the budget. But it's really at, at its core, it's really a way of trying to squeeze the PFD. If you set if you set the 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 take at only five percent and don't have the ability to in the earnings reserve account to take more or to sort of use that as a balance account, then you're really going to be squeezing the PFD even tighter into a into a smaller and smaller amount. This week or this past week. Uh, we talked about this on the show last week, and it was a. It, I, it, I think it was number one because it's something that's really troubling me. Uh, this week, it's sort of down to number two, but the the articles are continuing. Larry Persley had a uh, had a uh, op ed in the Wrangell Sentinel, which he owns, uh, which was picked up in the Ketchikan Daily News, and I'm sure will spread Juno and, and Anchorage and Fairbanks along the way. The headline is: It's only permanent if we change it. Uh, and it's talking about the fact the earnings reserve is at risk, and we need to we need to change the the structure of the permanent fund to combine the corpus constitutionally combine the corpus and the earnings reserve, and and goes on from that. Here's the deal. We talked about this last week, but I want to emphasize it again. Here's the deal that's being left out in all of these columns. The one in the one that James, the one that that Andrew Kitcheman did first in the in the the Beacon, the one that James Brooks did in the Beacon, the one that Matt Buxton has done in his uh, 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 Midnight Sun blog, which is now called the Alaska Memo, uh, and the one that personally and the one that personally is missing, and I'm sure the Binkley family blog, I'm sure the ADN op-ed page will come will come to it uh, as well along the way. Here's what they're missing: There's eight billion dollars, eight billion dollars, eight billion dollars. They got taken out of the earnings reserve uh, over the last uh, over the last few years. Four billion got taken out in FY20. Four billion more got taken out in FY22. They weren't required. Uh, they weren't necessary for dividends. They weren't required to fund government. They weren't required for inflation proofing. They, they were just unilateral takes by the legislature from the earnings reserve and putting that money in the uh, permanent fund corpus. So if you have an account that's supposed to have $12 billion in it and you take $8 billion out, you, you, you secrete $8 billion of it into the, into the permanent fund corpus, and you only have $4 billion left, yeah, you got a problem. But the problem isn't, isn't that you've only got $4 billion left. The problem is you took $8 billion out. Here's, here's what the solution to, that, to, the, to the issue should be. That eight, the, the first $4 billion explicitly was treated as a prepayment of future inflation proofing payments. And, and the second four billion should be treated in the same way because it, it wasn't taken out for any statutory reason. It wasn't taken out for any good policy reason. It was just taken out. And it should be, and it should be treated as a prepayment of inflation proofing in future years as well. If you do that, 
if you treat that $8 billion as prepayment of inflation proofing, we're good to the end of the decade. And we're probably good way beyond that, but we're at least good to the end of the decade. And we don't be we don't need to be going into this panic mode about, about where the earnings reserve is going. So, but but you read any of these articles, you read the original Kitchenman article, you read the Brooks article, you read the Matt Buxton article, you read the Larry Persley editorial, none of them, none of them mention the $8 billion. It's like, it's like, well, it disappeared. Now we got, now we got a problem because we only got 4 billion left. Well, because it's it's just, and it's it's just like a scam. It's just like a scam. It's a crisis of our own making. And by our own making, I mean, Bert Stedman's making, because that's what it was. They transferred that money out of there to put more pressure on the ERA and the fund in the future to have an argument to say, well, look, now we're running out of money. We're only running out of money because you transferred $8 billion over there in the last five years. Yep. And, and none, none, and that's not picked up in any of these commentaries. It's like, it's like, well, somehow magically by op, by its, by its regular operation, we're down to the last $4 billion. And that's a huge, that's a huge problem. Well, it's not, that's not what happened. It's not by opera, by its own operation. We're down to $4 billion. We're down to $4 billion because, because the legislature took $8 billion out of it and stuck it into the corpus. So it's, I, I mean, it's, it, 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 it keeps striking me. Every time I read this, it's like a scam. Oh, my God, we're down to $4 billion. There's a crisis. There's, you know, where's the $8 billion? I mean, tell me about the $8 billion. Tell me how we treat the $8 billion, and then maybe we can have a discussion. Problem is, if they talk about the $8 billion and they admit that the $8 billion should be treated as a prepayment, there is no problem. So it's, I, I just, I, Every time I see one of these articles and the $8 billion isn't mentioned, it's just, I mean, they're just scamming the public. Well, again, this has been the whole push the entire time. For the last 10 years, this has been the push as to what, uh, you know, what direction we're going on this. Um, All right. uh, Final thoughts on number two before we move on to number three, Brad? Well, it's just, if anybody, if if, whenever you see these headlines, ask yourself and ask your friends and ask your representative, what about the $8 billion? What about the inflation pr- proofing prepayment? Doesn't that mean we don't have a problem? And if you get, if you get somebody, if you get a, especially if you get a legislator, that looks at you with like deer, deer in the headlights, who doesn't understand what's going on, you know, the scam is working. So just right. when you talk to your rep or when you talk to anybody, ask about the $8 billion. Well, especially since SB 26 and the POMV was supposed to eliminate, that was supposed to have the inflation proofing baked in, but they seem to have forgotten that part of it. That was part of the pitch was that it had inflation proofing baked in, and now they're trying to figure it out outside of that, and that's part of this crisis moment as well. So it's disingenuous. The whole thing uh, overall is just disingenuous. Um, All right. Well, let's move on to number three which is capital projects. And you say capital projects, a lesson from the past. What can we learn from the past, uh, Brad? How can we inform our future choices? One of my first, uh, one of my first activities or one of my first issues uh, when, I, when I started uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and indeed even before that, when I started worrying about fiscal policy, was the amount of money that Bill Stoltz, frankly, wh- who was then chairman of the House Finance Committee, was sticking into the capital budget for various projects. Uh, the American Airlines Arena, or excuse me, the Alaska Airlines Arena at the UAA campus was all state funded. The, the Matsu campus of, uh, of UAA, all those buildings out there were all state funded. One other piece of that was the Matsu rail extension. You remember the rail extension that was gonna run down to the, right. to the Port of McKenzie and, and buying, right. buying the right of way for that and starting the build of that. and you know, and all the benefits that was going to bring to the Matsu. I, that just, I mean, you could see it, you could see it uh, 10,000 miles away that this was not, the economics were not supporting this. The, the, the coal sales out of the Healy mine to Korea, which everybody touted were going away. There weren't any other mineral developments that were going to, that were going to pay it, pay the way for that railroad extension. And it just, it was just a way that Bill Stoltz was running more and more and more money into the Valley, trying to, you know, build up, build up his, his reputation and his, and his connections and spending money uh, and, and, and his friends who were, who were do, doing these things, building these things, just trying to build away. Well, I, I had to chuckle the other day when I read the Frontiersman and the, and the headline was end of the line for rail link to Port McKenzie, burrow to pursue, 
pursue conversion to a road. Uh, it's finally, the rubber's finally come to hit the road. People have figured out the rail extension doesn't work um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and they're going to cancel it and talk about now, you know, using that, the cleared right away and all the buildup uh, to convert it to a road. It's, it, it, it's humorous to me because I took a lot of slings and arrows. I mean, there was a herald at the time who kept, you know, whamming me for, you know, being against the rail extension because I thought it was a, a boondoggle. And, and it was, and, and I just took a lot of slings and arrows back in that time for being opposed to the rail extension and being opposed to some of the other capital spending items. It just, just, I chuckled when, uh, when, uh, when I saw that headline, but it does inform going forward. It does inform going forward. There's two things that I think it does inform. One is the Ambler road extension, uh, that, that the administration seems to be hell bent on doing even though there's not an economic case, there's not a, a, a there's not companies out there who are willing to pay the fare that support that road. They'll say they are, but they haven't put their money where their mouth is in terms of prepayments and in terms of commitments uh, to use that road. So that's that's one that's sort of the new Matsu rail extension. And the other is the Anchorage Assembly is pushing ahead on making uh, changes to the to the Port of Alaska, what they renamed the Port of Alaska to try to get state support of it. And the and the Anchorage Assembly is going is starting to make commitments about the redesign and the and the construction at the port. I'm not sure Anchorage has got the money to do it. Uh, and and what we may be seeing is the beginning of the of the next level of if you build it, the state will have to pay for it in the end. <laughs> if, right. Yeah, it's if, not if you I'll, build it, they will come. It is if you build it, the state will pay for it. And and so I'm I'm concerned. I mean, I know it's a municipal matter. I know it's it's being handled by the assembly, but from a state fiscal standpoint, I'm concerned about what the assembly is doing at the port of Anchorage. Anchorage, because I'm I, I can just see yeah. that. Oh, but you have to pay for it now. Type yeah. Of, well, there's multiple options again. on the table right now, and the one that's being favored by the mayor includes a 200 million dollar increase for larger facilities. That even the shippers and the users there at the port say that's too much. We don't need, so I don't know, they're like trying to future-proof it when there's no demand. If you build it, they will, I don't know. But it's $200 million worth of if come, and I'm just not sure that that makes sense either. Uh, more boondoggles ahead, I guess. That's the history of the state right there in a nutshell. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it, you know, we look at this and, and the assembly is like, well, they want one thing. Uh, the mayor and others want another uh, but I had to laugh because even the ADN is saying, you know, that the mayor is pushing for this. Uh, uh, the mayor is pushing for this uh, change, but uh, he said that, uh, you know, they're pushing for a, a, an expanded building concept that would build uniformly wide terminals capable of ac accommodating larger cranes for offloading cargo. But it's two hundred million dollars more expensive and it's received pushback from the assembly cargo companies that use the facility. And uh, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski is what the article quotes here. But what got me was that even the cargo companies are like, whoa, 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 that's way more room than we need. Why would you spend an extra $200 million on stuff that we can't use? Uh, I mean, that seems like the definition of a boondoggle at that point. It, it does. And, and you know, it's we talk a lot about the market in this state. We're, you know, we're all Republicans. We talk about, you know, respecting the market. Well, let's respect the market. I mean, let's look back at the Matsu Rail Extension. Nobody was willing to pay for that. The reason the state was 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 paying for it was to was to have a boondoggle because the companies, Usabelli sure as hell wasn't willing to pay for it. The Korean coal companies weren't willing to pay for it. Nobody was willing to pay for it. But you know, we 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 had to have it. Ambler Road. Well, we need this. Why? Nobody's willing to pay for it. They'll tell you they are. They'll tell you they'll develop things if and and they'll pay for it if things come along. But they're not standing by it in the event, you know, it doesn't work out, uh, and the and the and the mines never operate, or the or the you know road never gets finished, or 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 anything like that. It's the same thing with the port. The market's telling you, we don't want that. We the shippers, we the 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 carriers are not willing to pay the tariffs that are going to result from that sort of construction. And but yet, you know, we plow ahead because we want the best and the best and we want the best and the latest and we want the newest and and all that sort of stuff. And it's just listen to the market. If the market's not willing to pay for it, don't do it. And 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 we've continually ignored the market in this state 
which has continually run us into boondoggles oh. like the Matsy Rail Extension, like okay. Ambler, and like the port threatens to be. And Brad, that's because they know better than you how that money <laughs> went, right? <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I, I joke about it, but that really is what all this boils continues. Every problem we seem to be talking about all boils down to somehow these politicians and these bureaucrats, they've been anointed by God with some kind of special knowledge that they know better than you how that money needs to be spent. And that's like, it makes no sense when the shippers are saying, whoa, 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 uh, you know. We couldn't fill that up with a hundred years worth of whatever. And they're like, well, but we still need it. We're future proofing it $200 million more. I mean, you know, you, you'll have to pay, you know, I mean, it's, it's, but this is what happens time and time and time again. And it's always OPM. It's always other people's money. Oh, their sure hope it is. is. Oh, sure it is. Yeah. Their hope is, is if they build it out big enough, somebody will have to step in and pay for it. You know, it's you like, know, go ahead. And you know who the OPM is? The OPM is ultimately the PFD. It's ultimately middle and lower income Alaska families and whoever had Keith Lee won't mention middle and lower income Alaska families on their bingo card, you win or you lose, which, whichever, whichever side of that you have, but that's what's happened. The, the, the money we spent on the Matsu rail extension, the state money we spent on the rat Matsu rail extension was less money we had in the CBR and ultimately uh, less money that we've had to support state spending and ultimately leads to a reduction in the PFD. The same thing with the Ambler Road project, the same thing with this port, the other people's money that will be that the state ultimately will be looking at to cover the cost of the port is uh, is reductions in the PFD. So it's yeah, they're dealing with other people's money and they're dealing with they're dealing with other people's money that they aren't. I mean, it's the top 20 percent making these making these decisions, knowing that they can backstop it by cutting the, the payments that are that are important to middle and lower income Alaska families. It's. Uh, you know, we say we're Republicans in this state. We say we believe in the market. We really don't. Well, it's right. <laughs> Again, because we care about one thing and one thing only. That is the continuation of the public economy over anything else, including the private economy. I mean, again, they're not listening to the private economy people. They're not looking at it. This is, you know, again, more government spend for government's sake because we know better. We know better that that's, oh, we, we predict that that's going to expand and government will pay for it. And so we're happy and people will be employed by it and that'll be good. That's what the whole thing is about. And and the, they are listening to a very small sector, the very fairly small segment of the private economy. And that's the private economy gets to build this stuff. You know, the contractors. Oh, boy. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, oh gosh, let's build let's a Let's go for the $200 million option. We'd like to get, I have a pool to put in the back of my yard. <laughs> I have kids to put through college. I have, you know, I have vacations to take. I have that second condo down in, down in Hawaii to buy. You know, yeah, build that sucker. Yeah, that's, we, we need all of that. That's, that's what's driving this. That's what drives these projects. That's what drove the Matsu rail extension, Bill Stoltz's ego, plus, you know, contractors wanting to spend money on it. That's what drives Ambler Road, and that's what's driving driving the port. People, yes, we, we need to build that stuff. I need to get the contracts, and I need to buy that second condo down in Hawaii. It's, uh, well, I mean, I guess we've been doing this for a long years, a lot of years. It's a little disappointing to continue to watch the same things happen over and over. I feel like it's Groundhog Day, only with a change of scenery, right? It's the same thing over and over and over again with just a set dressing change. And here we go. Uh, what a change. What a change. It, the, the, the thing that triggered it this week was seeing that article about the Matsu rail extension. We're finally going to give up. I mean, it, it just sat out there for sat out there for a long time. We'll get back to that. Don't worry about it. We're going to have we're going to have mining someplace and we'll we'll use that someday. Um, and that was sort of the theory. And we may still be there. I mean, people may say, oh, no, we can't put a road over yeah. that. We need we still need to preserve it. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.